Next thing we're going to look at is uh, storing things on Google Cloud Storage. And I think I'll just show you a couple of uh, things working. And then I don't know, we'll maybe look at documentation or, or look at code. I don't know which order we'll do. Um, da, 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 da. And uh, change directories. I got the power! Wah, wah. You guys even know that song? Where am I? I don't have my little things up there because I don't have anything open. Well, that's not going to work, is it? Go upstairs. See what's in here. It's not even anything in no, there. Okay. I think we'll let's run it first. Go app serve. We will take this moment to have a notice from our sponsor. There are too many files. All right. Localhost 8080. Choose a file. Sample TXT, submit, cool, choose another file, sample MD, put, we're just putting files, and then if we look at uh, this place, console.cloud.google.com, so you could do Google Cloud Console, and in my old videos you'll see me uh, Google Developer Center or some other phrase, but now it's Google Console developers, Google. So Google Cloud Console. Makes sense. Google Cloud Console. Go into learning and or whatever uh, your project. Or whatever, be. yeah. So you get you create a project, and I'm going into learning, and then I'm going to go into storage. And then once inside storage, I've got buckets. We'll learn what buckets are in a second, and there are my files. So Google Cloud Storage does not work locally when you're running Go App Serve. It must have a project that it works with online. It's yeah. technically a separate project from App Engine, and so it integrates really well with App Engine. But since it's technically separate, your Go app serve does not emulate it. So pretty cool. And close that. I guess it doesn't matter. Um, close this. And O3. Go app serve. Now we're going to get a file, and I'm going to delete these. So now I have nothing there. I'm going to refresh, nothing there. And if I come back here and refresh, nothing there. Choose a file. I wonder if I store anything in cookies. I might have been at some point. I have the recollection I was doing that. So let's just get rid of clear all. There we go. So now I'll upload uh, from O3 the same stuff. Submit. And choose another one. MD submit. So same stuff, uploading. And if I refresh, my files are there. And then if I uh, if I click on this, I now go to a new URL and it'll retrieve the documents. Love, exciting and new. Come aboard. No. I mean I didn't miss my career as a singer. <laughs> Or the A-team. I didn't go for like the quite so mystical poet quotes this time. I was in a more like childhood TV show mood when I put this together. You guys remember the A-team? No, nobody ever watched the A-team. You watched the A-team? What were you like, two? <laughs> so that's uh, putting and getting. And I don't know if I finished this media link did thing. You put, did, did you try putting a picture and getting Oh, no, I didn't get to that part. I'm slightly under-prepped for today's lecture. Ideally, I would have liked to have all that I done. Think, but there's... I'm, I'm just thinking, I wonder if your, your get file will work with the pictures already. We could try. Might. You want to you want try uploading one, see what happens? Danger, live Danger. dangerously. Should we go with that one or this one? All in favor of 01, raise your hand. All in favor of 02, raise your hand. 
O2 wins. JPEG. Ta-da! Picture works. Refresh. All right, so uh, media link. I don't know if I got that was put file, get file, media link, object attributes. I think I died on. I stopped working on object attributes. So let's uh, see what media link does. Oh, media link's just another way of getting the links out. So that's not going to show you anything new. So the next thing we're going to look at now is uh, just this instructions. And the easiest way to look at the instructions is to go to GitHub because they'll actually be rendered as GitHub Markdown, which is nice. And by the way, there's more than 23 of you in this class. So if you haven't started this yet... I like the 404 on Golang training. Ooh, that's awesome. <laughs> I'll get a bigger picture of that. And include... Looking at this without red. Yeah. My mouse is acting funny. Without red? Oh, yeah. Projectors. Oh, projectors yeah. Thank you. Both projectors, so I think it's probably the cable. So, uh, yeah, I get free popcorn if I get a lot of stars. I don't know if you guys know that. So <laughs> go in there and star it for me. What am I looking at here? Uh, the the MD there we instructions. Go. Here we go. So uh, make sure you're set up for App Engine. So this is like awesome in action, bundled in a little MD file. And am I recording? I am. Because this is just like classic awesomeness right here. Set up for App Engine. Make sure your environment is configured for App Engine. If you've not worked with App Engine, please see Hello World on Go App Engine at that URL. Okay, cool. Create a project on Google Cloud Platform App Engine. If you have not already, make sure you have a project on Google Cloud Platform. Right. So you got to go create a project. So that's like when I'm looking at this console here and I go into manage all projects, right? I might create a project and I create a new project. So that's creating a project and there's the, there's the link to do it, right? So create a project on Google. Create a default cloud storage bucket. So uh, let me see where I talk about buckets. The default, the default cloud storage bucket should view as the instructs here. But since last summer, it's changed like twice in how yeah. you do it. Yeah, so, uh, it's so easy now. I was okay. like pleasantly surprised. Yeah. So you got to know two things. You got to know about buckets and you got to know about objects. What do you think an object is? Well, it sounds like uh, something that you can do in job. I almost want to say it's something that you would use to... Well, a bucket sound, sounds more or less what it sounds like. It's something that you hold, mm -hmm. right? So um, I'm trying to not look at this and get the, the name. I know, it's hard, right? huh? So, Here, let me help you. So, uh, or this mode. There we go. Well, in, op, in C++, an object is generally something that you give attributes to. I know! Such a dangerous word. Right? Like object when you start talking about programming and people all of a sudden start accessing all of this material about object oriented programming in their head. And objects just whatever the hell you uploaded. You uploaded this object. It's a picture, it's a file, it's whatever the hell you uploaded. Okay? And a bucket is the place you uploaded it to. So in your project, in here, you create a project and I've created one learning and then I come in here and I could click on this little thing right here and I could go down to storage. And then I could come into storage, and I, I, I have here buckets. These are my buckets. And I could create a new bucket if I wanted. So right now I've got learning 1130 appstopcom bucket. So I might have a bucket user photos. I might have a bucket, you know, uh, user, user word processing documents, whatever. However I want to organize my stuff, right, I could create buckets for my application. I'm in this learning application. That's where it shows me. I'm in that project right now, right? And these are the buckets on Google Cloud Platform storage that I can stick stuff in. And then what I stick in, in buckets, I stick objects. So this one's got three objects, okay? There are no folders, file folders in, in, uh, in your buckets. It's a bucket, that's it. You can name your objects with forward slashes. So if you wanted to, you could 
you know, approximate folder structure by just saying, you know, users forward slash, username forward slash, day of the week, date, right? forward slash file and then when you download that file name you can then parse it however in your programming split on forward slash and it'd be almost like okay I'm looking at this in this directory structure and I think it'll even display on, it to on you this, right on this particular console it'll, it'll also read the forward slashes and act yeah. as if it's folders. and, and show it's you not really yeah. but it will look like it's folder yeah but in reality it's just a big bucket where you're throwing stuff throwing objects okay by the way, the reason why he's got such a weird uh, bucket name is that bucket names have to be unique across all of Google, everyone's projects. So that particular bucket name, learning uh, 1130appspot.com, is, uh, is, that's, that's going to be unique. No one else has got that name anywhere. That's my project ID. So, so you might want a bucket name pictures. You're not going to get it. Someone's already got it, pretty much, probably. <laughs> You might go in and like create a whole bunch of buckets with really valuable names and then create a website saying, I'm selling bucket names. I'm a bucket name squatter. And if you want a good bucket name in your programming, let's talk. I don't think you'll get much out of that, except a lot of vitriolic emails. <laughs> All right, so you create a bucket, right? And at the time I wrote this, you find this whatever. So I, here I explain how to get there, right? And then, uh, and then you get a free five gigabyte cloud storage bucket. So the first time you go into this, and let me just go into one of my other projects, like I don't know, Whack a President. I don't think has any buckets, right? Enable billing, learn more buckets, settings. I go to settings. No, I probably just revealed all kinds of proprietary confidential information right at timestamp. 1203. Would that reveal confidential stuff? Cloud storage IDs? The cloud storage IDs, yes. All right, I got to take that out. Where are my buckets? Cloud storage, I want to learn more about bucket pricing. Maybe I have to click enable billing. No. Cancel. Don't want Let me look at this here and read my own notes. Uh, go to this link. Uh, computer app and it says App Engine's something else. So yeah, it's not the uh, storage. It's... Oh, cool. That's where I have to go. I have to go to settings. App yeah. Engine settings. All right, so the way I would have gotten there from here is I go back up here and I go down to App Engine. I knew, I thought I had a good sense of settings. I go to App Engine. Now I'm in App Engine and I go to settings for App Engine and then default cloud storage bucket create. So I get five gigabytes free. And that process is so much easier than in the fall. We had to create all these like PIM security keys, and we had to go during the summer. We had to go to the old uh, Google nuts. Cloud website that was like deprecated three years ago, but they still had to keep it around because that one button was not actually in the new UI. <laughs> yeah, it was awesome. You should have been there. It was so much and fun. And it didn't work. <laughs> it was broken for like the week that we were going over it. Yeah, it was a little bit of a pain. So it's cool that, that this is like so, uh, so, for, so for st straightforward. Yeah, so they put the uh, default storage bucket in App Engine settings instead because you get one free one with your App Engine project. But then uh, you can have as many buckets actually as you want actually by going through storage, but that requires billing because you have to pay for that storage. But you get a 5 gigabyte bucket free though. In, uh, with App Engine projects. Per project, you get one. Per project. project. Yeah, per project, you get a free bucket. Free five gigabytes. I sometimes forget if commit has one T or two. I always miss the second M. The other day I was writing and I, I wrote, uh, We are all going to get uh, together soon. I was like, wait, is that how you spell git? And like for like 10, 15 seconds, I was like, or maybe probably like five seconds, but it felt like 15 seconds. I had this brain fart where I couldn't remember how to spell git. And I was like, cool, man. Git has fully integrated into my life, right? So I've just been typing G-I-T so much. So uh, you also need to download these packages right here. And this is a cool notation, which is, uh, I don't think that's a Unix command line. I think that's unique to Go, but triple dots means just 
get everything recursively from that point forward. So you need to make sure you have all those packages. And you want to configure your app YAML. So this is pretty much like what we have already, you know, but just a reminder of that. And then uh, reading documentation. When you look up documentation on godoc.org, go to the parent package, then look at directories. Well, that's not very clear, so let's figure that out, and maybe I'll add a little note in there. So documentation, maybe for these things up here. Oh, I have an example. How awesome of me. For instance, if I wanted to see the documentation on this package, Google golang.org app engine file, I would go to this package, app engine, then click on directories. So I just kind of want to show how Godoc works. So here I'm at Godoc, and uh, I'm going app engine, right? And I look for all the things with App Engine and App Engine, App Engine. And I'm, I'm not really seeing storage, right? I'm looking App Engine Log, Data Store, Memcache, URL Fetcher, User Task Queue Search, uh, App Engine, and Mail, Client. And then we're into third party packages, Stalk, Stalker down here, IMDB has an app engine package that you may or may not want to use, right? But so I'm going to go right to straight to App Engine. And then I could go down to Directories. And down here at directories, uh, now I've got some other stuff. There's a lot of internal things, but uh, search, socket, runtime. Files. Is up, uh, files. File. <laughs> That's not what I was looking for. I'm confused. So Google Cloud. Okay, App Engine, Google Cloud. So let me look at my MD here for a second, figure out what I'm trying to do. Your example, example file, and then I would go to this package, App Engine. Okay, whatever. And then here's an example for Google Cloud Storage, okay? So uh, Golang Cloud Storage. So if I was at Godoc and I search for storage, see what comes up. And uh, GitHub, Juju, all private stuff. So let's try searching for Google and see what happens. Go. Uh, Golang, GitHub, Golang. So, what is it? Google Cloud. Google Golang.org cloud storage. I guess just cloud storage is what you want to enter. Or Google Cloud would be good, huh? But that won't bring anything up. Google Golang.org cloud. Okay, so cloud is kind of the keyword for finding that. And then we get to the files. No, we get to the directories. And, uh, and then here, like, for package cloud, Google Golang.org cloud, and that's what we brought in right here, cloud, all right? Uh, we are looking for storage. storage. So we come down here, and confusingly, data store, right? Because wasn't our data store app engine? Yeah. Um, this Google Cloud stuff is, all, is for both app engine and uh, compute engine. So that's probably access to data store for if you need a data store on your compute engine. So godoc.org yes. data store. All right, we have App Engine data store. And we have package data store, Google Golang Cloud data store, and Google Golang.org app engine data store. And uh, and they look like they have different Different, different, they're different files, right? So they're going to be different in some way. Anyhow, you're using App Engine. <clears throat> Use the App Engine Data Store. <clears throat> so uh, we want storage, though. So come down to storage, and then files. There are your files. No more directory. That's it. And then index right here. So we'll look at this index here in a second. All right. So I probably just thoroughly confused you, but uh, it was a little bit confusing just bang your way around the documentation. And the thing that I guess you want to look for is, uh, what did we do? We did cloud, right? And we got to that. And then when we got to that, we, we found storage. All right, whatever. Um, so I have just some notes to remember here. And we'll come back to these in a second. I think we'll look at the code first. All right, so that's just getting set up. And once you're all set up, this is what you can do. So, <clears throat> init, handle func, handler, handler func with our response writer and the request. Context, if request URL path is not that, then not found is our response and return. 
Otherwise, we're going to have some HTML. The HTML part of it will be a form, right? We're going to ask for an input type file, which means we need ink type, multi-part, form data. And we're just giving the name of whatever is being uploaded, you know, so when we access it from the submitted content on the server, we're giving it what we're wanting to access to Hui, because that was the, I don't know, what came to mind for me. It's like a Hawaiian gang. It used to be a gang and somehow it transformed into a clothing line. They used to be like 20 years ago, the guys who beat you up on the North Shore, and now they have this really popular clothing line. <laughs> so I guess they grew up and realized they had to pay for mortgages and feed kids and send them to school. And they started a clothing line. <laughs> it's kind of funny. Um, and, uh, and then here's post, right? So when we have a post come in, if the request method is post, then we're going to request form file. And request form file is from... The request, it's from the request... HTTP. Is from package HTTP, net HTTP, right? And request form file, you know, is just requesting a form file. So we say what's the name of the variable, and it gives back to us, it gives back to us a multi part file, multi part file header, and an error. So a multi part file, my understanding, and it's not a very deep one, is a file that's made, made broken into multiple parts and been sent over the web. What's your take on it? That might not be correct. Um. Actually, the best way to think about it is actually emails are multi-part files. You send an email to someone, you set, you're you sending an HTTP version, you're sending a, just a plain text version, if it, just in case their uh, viewer doesn't support HTTP emails, and then you send each attachment separately. And it's a multi-part file because it has all of them in a single file. Cool. So it's a file that's been broken up to be sent over the web. Is that right? The no? attachments are all different files, technically, so... Oh, okay. Okay. But then those so attachments get reassembled into the one so intended file, is that right? Kind of. It's an email, so it's like you're not looking at all the attachments all at once. It's mm. It gets confusing. But let me just say, parsing emails go is painful, and I should not have done it when I did. <laughs> but you did do it, and that's awesome. So here we have the multi-part file, the header, and the error. And, uh, and then we handle the error, and you can kind of look at that on your own. And we def and since it's a file, we got to defer the close of it, right? So multi-part file close. And I'm just wondering, like, if we click on this and we say a hey, multi-part file, right? And we come here, and we see it's got a reader and a closer, right? Which means you really need to be thinking about closing it if it's got a closer. Close error. It wraps the basic close method. That's my thinking on that. Is that accurate the way I just described that? Yeah. If it's got yeah. a closer, you really want to think about closing it. I think there's only one exception where there's a closer that you don't have to close. I can't remember what it is off the top of my head, though. So now we're going to handle uploading the file. So I created a little function to upload the file just to abstract the code, make it a little cleaner. And you pass in the request, the multi-part file, and the header of the file. So this is the file stuff, these last two right there. So what's upload file do? Right? It's going to return a string and an error. And first of all, I'll pass in the header. And, and then I do a file filter. So this is kind of cool. So with the header, you can access different stuff. So temp colon equal header dot file name header open. Okay? So file name. I want the file name. So I get the file name. And, uh, and then I do strings last index. So last index returns the index of the last instance of sep in s or negative one if sep is not present in s. So here is my string. Here is my separator. So let's say that I had a file name, a file name like uh, great American novel dot doc. Doc tells me it's a word document, right? And there's the dot in there. And the, the file extension is preceded by a dot. So if I look for that dot, I know that everything after that is the file extension. I want to know what the file extension is that just got uploaded. And so I say strings last inst index, the name of this file that just came in, and look for the dot and go from the dot forward one. So I went from dot doc, from the dot to the D. I want the D all the way to the end, right? So this is right here. This is string slicing. All right, so I just sliced the string. So string slicing, how many people are like, when you hear me say string slicing, conceptually, 
you get it, but uh, in practice you're kind of like, uh, I'm not totally clear on that. How do I go to GoLang Playground from here? So uh, hello playground is my string. Well, let's just do the great American novel dot dog. And uh, and then string slicing would be format dot print line string. This will give me everything. So they have something like slicing in Python. Here, if I don't want 0, 1, 2, I just want Great American Novel, I'm going to go from 3 forward. So that's 0, that's 1, that's 2. G is 3. So give me 3, 4. There'll be greatamericannovel.com, right? And if I just want Great American, uh, it'd be 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 up to not including the last element. So go to 16, Great American. So that's string slicing, right? And if I wanted to do that, you know, uh, new string, colon equal, and strings dot last index, um, and then uh, my string, and the one I'm looking for is dot, right? And now if I wanted to see where is that dot, print line, new string R, it's just going to give me a number. Format to get the strings. Get format to get the strings uh, library. You Thank go. you. So that gave me at position twenty one is my dot, right? So if I now if I now say okay here I want from nstr plus one, right? It's going to give me twenty two. Oh, I want that on the forward part. It's going to give me from twenty two to the end. If you just leave it open, it goes all the way to the end, right? So that gave me my doc. How many people that helped you and was elucidating for you? How many people that was like you were doing homework for another class and you just looked up to see what was going on? The plus one also helps the one error that you can get. Um, if you put negative one as the uh, first index, it will give you a panic and crash your entire Go program, which negative one is what last index gives you back. Well, dear Lord, we won't want that. Which negative one is what the last index gives back if it can't find the symbol. But since you're saying plus one, you go from if it zero. can't find it, it'll go, it'll just grab the entire string. Sometimes some things just sound better in a southern accent. And my mom's side of the family, we're all a bunch of southerners. And uh, so that's where I come by that. What's up? So, uh, hang on. So this is... So why again did you need the plus one after the period? So he didn't want the, he wouldn't, didn't want to keep the period. He just wanted the symbols after it. But it also fixed the problem of if it didn't find a period, you can't go from negative one on. You can go from zero on though. That so gave me kind of, so kind of just gave a side effect of uh, also fixed the error of if the symbol doesn't exist. That gave me from twenty one forward, which is this forward. And I really want from 22 forward, so let me add one to it. And now I have my file extension, doc, right? Without that one, I get dot doc. And with that one, I get just doc. So now that I have the file extension, ext, I can come down here and do a switch and case any of these, return the extension and nil, so no error. And otherwise, return the extension and say, we do not allow file types of this type. We only allow JPEG, JPEG text MD extensions. So that's just kind of like a filter for what are people uploading. And I think that's really pretty... It's pretty a weak filter, but it still it works. Yeah, it's a weak filter. But I think, you know, at a rudimentary level, that's pretty good. And like, uh, I forget which email program used to give me grief if I tried to send an access file. So if I need to email somebody a, a Microsoft Access database file, I'd just take the extension off and I can do it. And then they'd add it back on. All right, so then I'm going to get a SHA of, uh, of my multi-part file, just for a unique name, and add the extension onto it along with a dot. And I'm going to reset the read-write head back to the beginning of the file in case I need to read it all again. 
So that's what that seek deal does. And uh, now I'm going to put the file, right? So all I did here is create a name and upload file. Now I'm going to put it. And to put the file, I pass in the name of the file, the new name I just created, and the multi-part file. And now when I put it, I have the name, which I just passed in, the name of the file. And here I'm passing in a multi-part file. And over here, in, in, this, in the definition of this function, I'm saying it takes a reader. So we have some polymorphism. Right, and I just did like, hey, it's an interface, right? And a file implements the reader interface. You could read a file just in the most basic logical level. We could read files. But if we went in and we looked at multi-part file, which we already saw right here, right? Form file, multi-part file, multi-part file. Right here, it implements a reader, IO reader. So it implements the reader. So I'm just saying, okay, it takes a reader. And we're going to be reading it. So, so now I do storage new client. So this is how you use Google Cloud Storage. You got to create a client, okay? And when you create a client, new client, 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 type client, new client. So when you create a client, you get back a pointer to a client and an error. All right. So pointer to a client and an error. And now that I have a client, I could call something like bucket. And so here's my client, and I could call bucket, right? Because when you have a pointer to a client, you have this method. So I could call bucket, and that's going to give me a bucket handle, a pointer to a bucket handle. Well, if I have a pointer to a bucket handle, I now have all these methods, okay? So I'm going to do new client, bucket, and then I'm going to do object. And basically what I'm doing is I'm naming my bucket. There's my name of the bucket I want to put this in, and I'm naming the object. And here's the name of the object I'm, I'm storing, right? So here we have new client, give me my client, now client, bucket, here's the name of the bucket, and that's just a constant I've defined right here in main, or the main page, right? So that's just the learning 1130appspot.com, which corresponds to I'm in the wrong project. Learning 1130appspot.com, that's my bucket. All right, so I'm saying, okay, there's my bucket, and right here, client, bucket, there's my bucket, <coughs> object, well, that's the name I just created and passed in. And then, and then with an object, we could do new writer. So we have bucket, object, gives us a pointer to an object handle. It's the bottom of the screen there. Right? That's what we get when we do object, that's what it returns. And object handle, we have new writer. So context and gives us a pointer to writer back. And so we got new writer context and then writer ACL, right? So we assign that to writer and then writer ACL, access control list, right? We could call that method writer. Wait, where am I? So client, new client, bucket, bucket handle, bucket handle, object, object handle. There we go. New writer. And the new writer gives us a pointer to a writer. So with a pointer to a writer, we have these things here. And then I guess writer just, what's going on there? There's no ACL. That's, that's in object attribute struct. Huh. It's not in the uh, writer. It's in the object attributes. It's in the object attributes. OK. That's cool. Anyhow, we could set the ACL and then copy to the writer the reader. So the reader is the file we just passed in, multi-part file. And we now copy that file to this writer, which we just created. And it's going to write this object to this bucket for this client. And return writer closed. Did I leave anything out there? I feel like there might be. I defer close the client. I don't, do I have to close a writer? Yes, because the uh, writing for... Close, uh, right there. Yeah, the writer, uh, in, in this case, I'm trying to think, it may be writing to the uh, Google Cloud Storage as you're putting the file, but the close is the part where it's actually, uh, it actually flushes got anything it. else that it may be working on. I've got it at the bottom, writer yeah, close. Yeah. So, 
it's, if you're sending a large file, it may be sending it as it goes, but like if you're just sending like a small file that can fit in memory or something, it may just kind of buffer it and then send it when you say close. So you have to close it separately from the, the client. So the main things you should be taking away, I mean, that's it's a little bit of a path to navigate to look at the documentation and be like, okay, well, let's see, how's this work? Well, I'm going to need a new client. And now that I've got a client, pointer to client, oh, I'm going to have to specify the bucket. And now that I've got a bucket, bucket handle, oh, i got to specify the object. And now that I have an object handle, I need to have a new writer so I can write. Okay, i got my new writer. Cool. Right? And now i got to remember to, and that gives me back a writer. And when I have a writer, I need to make sure I close that. Right? So that's like a... a looking at all the different things in that documentation to be able to figure that out just from the documentation, that's hard, right? But having somebody show you, okay, this is how you do it, and then understanding how you read the documentation, how everything's connected, that's one of the main things you should take away. And then the other thing is you got the code sample, you could just kind of like look at that and now integrate that into your application. And then over time, it'll become maybe more natural where you, you'll, you'll just think, oh, that's how it works, and you'll be able to make it work. So that is putting a file. Anybody have any questions or thoughts? How many people think that is horrible? That was so convoluted. Nobody? How many people think that is awesome? That's so easy to upload a file? Are you kidding me? Right in the middle. And uh, go ahead. If I remember correctly, the old style to do it required a different context in the App Engine context. You're right. It was, You're right. It was a massive, massive pain to upload to uh, Google Cloud Storage before because you had to like figure out security uh, security bypasses so you could actually access it because it was separate from App Engine. So they've really updated it and fixed it a lot in the last year. So now you just use an App Engine context to the new client used to be before you had to create an HTTP client that would send spe your secure send specified security things which you had to download from the website and configure so that it could actually talk and know that it's an allowed app to write to the bucket and yeah it was a big 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 hassle. So be glad you're learning it now that they fixed it all. Where did I get to those ACL things? I want to just make sure that it's in the, it's in the writer's ACL. It's in the writer. Is it? But well, but there's okay. It's so the, the writer the went to the writer, right? ACL, and then that's all uh, object attributes. But what is the object attached to? It's Type a pointer where, to the object, and you're closing it. Object attributes pointer to the object, and you're closing. It. Where's that here? Object attributes. That's writer. right. Yeah, no, it's coming from writer. That line seventeen is going to the next line. So your your writer is a writer, a cloud storage writer, and that writer has an ACL, and it also implements the writer interface. I got to figure that out. And then the close it returns an error instead of standard closers. Standard closers don't return anything. So this writer returns an error because it's actually doing the writing on close, which includes updating the ACL that you may have changed. So what was the, what does ACL stand for? Access control list. So he's not actually using it in this particular example, but basically if you don't want to filter access to the files on your own, uh, Google Cloud Storage actually does generate unique URLs for each file you update or you upload and you can use them instead of your own things and then you won't be using up your app engine uh, uh, resources, which you may be charged for. Okay, so the writer struct has object attributes. All right. Cool. So that's uh, get putting a file. How do you get a file? And yeah, let's just look at this get stuff first. So new client. And defer client close, and uh, and then which bucket, which object, new reader, and pass in the context, right? And that returns a read closer, which a read closer is just something that has a reader and a closer. It means you're going to read it, and then you got to close it, right? 
And so where do I call get file right here? It gives me back get file. I pass in the context and object name because get file takes context and the object name. And I do a new client, give it the context. And then I have a client, I say this bucket, this object, and I give it the name. And I do a new reader, it gives me back the read closer and an error. All right, so right here I get the reader and the error. I check the error. And, uh, and then defer reader close, and I copy from the reader to the response, because the response implements the writer interface. And copy just takes a writer and a reader, right? So pass in the reader, pass in the writer, output. And that's retriever, and retriever runs when you go to golden. <laughs> uh, can you go over that again, but a little bit slower this time? Sure. So to get a file, here in storage.go, we have get file. It's going to take in the context and the name of the file you want to get. And so it's just a function I wrote. And storage new client, pass in a context, gives us a client. Now that we have a client, we could, we could call the method bucket. Well, new client, if we look at the documentation, new client gives us a pointer to a client. Pointer to client, we could call bucket. Gives us a pointer to bucket handle. Pointer to buckle handle, we could call object. Gives us an object handle, right? So there we basically specified the bucket and the object, the name of the file we want to get and the bucket we want to get it from. And the client was re required because here's the context of which project we're working on who this user is, right? That's just Google keeping track of everything. And, uh, and then from having uh, object handle, object handle down here, we call new reader. So new reader returns a pointer to a reader and an error. And we pass back that, you know, pointer to a reader and an error. And, uh, Pointer to a reader, pointer to a reader, pointer to a reader is right here, and reader struct contains unfiltered, and it's got reader close and reader read, right? It gives us a pointer to a reader and uh, close and read. So that means it implements read closer, so we could pass it back right there because read closer has a reader and a closer, and that one just right here has the reader and the closer. I don't I didn't remember that IO closer had the return error from close. IO And then so when we call get file, we pass in the context and the name. And the name here is just being pulled from a form. So it's kind of a unrealistic example. You wouldn't really type in that long name. But you know, just a way to do it. Uh, we're not actually getting it from the form. We are going through the URL links, which are putting it into uh, oh, that's right. strings. That's right, thank you. Which the easiest way to get the value from a query string though is the form value thing. That help? Mm -hmm. All that stuff's online, so you can look through it. How did you guys ever teach computer science before GitHub? And then there's one more thing that you could do is you could get a media link. So this is where the ACL comes in handy. So here, uh, before I was passing back when I did my git file, now I, here's, well, do I still have git file here? No, I just have git file link, I got rid of it. So before my git file was like this, right, where I'm returning a read closer and an error. So basically I have a reader that I can read the file from. Now I'm returning a string. So I'm just getting a link. 
So when I do client bucket object, I call attributes context now. Before I was doing client bucket object new reader. Now I'm doing client bucket object attributes. So in the documentation, new client, pointer to a client, bucket, bucket handle, pointer to bucket handle, object, pointer to an object handle, uh, handle, and then I have all these methods available. And so before I called uh, new reader, which was this one right here. And this time I'm going to call attributes, which returns a pointer to object attributes. And type object attributes has bucket name, content, content length, cache control, ACL, owner, size, content encoding. Media link is a URL to the object's content. This field, field is read only. Oh, cool. Right, so I'm just basically passing back, that's the old file, passing back attributes media link and no error. And so where do I call that? I call it right here, which is uh, my HTML I'm building. The files is an H1, a heading, and then range over my file names, wherever file names is coming from, from my cookie, right? And... Um, and it's weird, I call it put cookie and I'm getting file names back. Uh, and then I do my, uh, you know, for each name, it's a map where I'm storing the, where I'm storing the file names as a map. So for each key, for each name, get a file link and that gives me the string. And then I just do h3, anchor, href, that, that, that URL. Right, so now it becomes a clickable link. That that URL in my HTML becomes a clickable link, and then I display the value of it there. That's HTML. I know if you haven't done any like if like web is totally new to you, you look at that and you're like, whoa, holy crap! Do I use a forward slash or a backslash to close HTML tags? <laughs> you know, but that's the that's what it does there. It just takes a little time to get familiar with it, be conversant in it. It's definitely taken me a little time. You want to show the difference between the URLs, between uh, the get files and the media links one? Yeah. And now we'll run this one. So this is a so 04. Show, show the get files one first so you can see the URL. Okay. And then show how it's different. I like your suggestions. The details, I don't always think of that because I'm like, got my brain kind of like an 88% CPU usage. And I don't know what I'm doing here. I'm uploading a file, right? Is that what I just started to do? Submit, upload file. Probably should have cleared cookie, but hopefully I programmed that to take care of it. I don't know what I have here. I created this icon, so I have to type that in all the time. And uh, I want my that one, and then I want uh, storage, and I want that one. And refresh. I got a bunch of stuff up there. Anyhow, yeah, I didn't need to upload anything. And uh, I'm looking for the web, and I'm looking for this one. And so here, the URLs, if you look at my bottom uh, left corner of my screen, I could copy that link address to and just paste it in, right? So it's basically going to localhost, and then that path, and then this is all parameters and so here's one variable that's labeled object and it has this name I don't know how far that goes that's it so just that file is what I'm asking to get right and if I went and I looked at my code I'd have a way to take that file name and, and get it off so that's what that code looks like and you know just to see it in action cool I didn't think it'd do that I didn't put in an image tag. But uh, I guess it's, it's just a it's file. It's just the plain image by itself. It's just the so. file, so it figures it out. Browser. <clears throat> well, Browser and awesome. The go, and the Go code, recognizing the first couple lines is a JPEG file and setting its content type automatically. That probably had a lot to do with it. Right. I think I want to have you teach a class sometime. <laughs> And be copilot. I want to try copilot one class. 
you've done that before. We'll just have to find like, oh, you already did it in here. You did the uh, DigitalOcean. All right, so I don't know if it matters if I clear out my cookie. I'll leave it in. Uh, so this one, see what happens. Choose a file, a one, submit. See if my cookie changes. Your internet's spotty. And uh, now when I look at these URLs, because I got the media link, totally different, right? It's not even to my to my site. It's no longer pointing at your uh, local host. Yeah, so this is just gonna this is gonna serve straight from Google, and I downloaded it. I'm downloading them instead of displaying them. That would be uh, that would be somewhere in the attributes, uh, which is probably what your O5 is. Fixing. Oh, really? It's not actually because I didn't get there. Mm. So I could set an attribute for it to not download. Most likely, I, I believe so. So, so the advantage <clears throat> to doing it through the media link, though, instead of through your own code, is that you're, if it's going through your own code, you have to pay for your time having your code running on the app on some app engine server, as well as you have to pay for the connection <coughs> to your system and the outgoing connection from your system to the cloud storage. Or you could just give them the link to the cloud storage directly, and they can just go to get it from the cloud storage themselves, and you don't have to pay for your app engine time or connections. But I change the attributes here, attributes control list, and add content them. type up above a little bit. Content type is my type, so I could change I think that. It, it's probably defaulting to uh, to like octet stream or something. So the next one, the so that, that's a good way to sort of build the next one. The next one I didn't finish building. We'll see how far I got here. Uh, where did I leave off? Right there. To do, to do left off here. And uh, I was going to show all the different, when you get the attributes, what are all the different attributes you could you could print out. And so this will actually, well, what's that? I need a plus there. This will actually uh, run. I just don't have them all listed what they do. Cache control. <coughs> ACL, owner size, content encoding. I guess we should type so, these. Just keep in know. mind, when you're using media link though, instead of through your own code, you have to make sure you do the access control list. So when he was doing the access control list before, he was setting it so that all users are allowed to read from it. So um, if you don't do that, then only your code is able to access it because your code's the one that uploaded it there, so it's the owner of the file of that particular object. So let me give you some homework, and I'll finish this out, and I'll show you it running. Um, and you guys watching online don't need to watch this. So thank you for tuning in. I hope it was valuable to you.